Today, Margaret and I are going to talk about our project that we're doing on um, education and enforcement in the area of prescription medications and drug driving in New Zealand. I'm just going to start us off and then Margaret will explain a little bit of the background and we'll do a bit of a tag team like that. So we've been developing education resources and this is um, the topic of substance impaired driving. Um, that requires us to actually explain what do we mean by substance impaired driving. Um, today, a lot of the talk has been about drugs. We're talking to meeting up and talking to drivers in general. Um, we know that the word drugs is typically used in the addiction sector and that the police often talk about drug users. But we also understand that when you're talking about most New Zealand drivers, they're thinking about taking their medications. And some of them might be thinking about um, illicit drugs or recreational drugs. But in New Zealand and lots of countries, medication is a significant source of what some of us might think of as drugs that impair driving. The other thing to think about is that in New Zealand, most people of driving age drink alcohol. And so alcohol being a drug that impairs driving also needs to be considered in the mix. Um, and looking at this uh, project, we haven't in any way said that we shouldn't focus on alcohol, but that we need to consider the mix of medications and drugs in that. Margaret's going to explain a bit more about our project now. Thanks, Anne. In terms of the project itself, um, it's called, we're calling it the Substance Impaired Driving Project and describing it as a community demonstration project. Absolutely crucial to this project is the high degree of collaboration across agencies that we've enjoyed. And that collaboration has led us to be able to access expertise and to um, access data sources that we wouldn't normally have. And so that's been a, a total strength. And I want to list some of these stakeholders now. We've worked very closely with the Ministry of Health. And in doing so, we've had gained access to Pharmac data. So one, some of the information that Anne's going to be sharing with you in more detail is the Pharmac data for the year 2012. We've actually analysed the prescribing patterns in that year. And within that, at a later date, what we've also done is looked at the classification of drugs and the percentage of medications that actually could impair driving with or without alcohol. We'll be offering that information today. We've worked very closely and continuing with the New Zealand Police, particularly with road policing, and through that have accessed the capability to retest blood alcohols. Not all national blood alcohols, but a certain number of them. And so what we have done is had um, blood alcohols where they've been in excess of back at a later date after the enforcement process retested for um, an assay of medications and drugs that we've already identified as those that could impair with or without alcohol, uh, with, with impair driving with or without alcohol. Um, we work very closely also with the Ministry of Transport, with Rachel's expertise and Leon Hurt, his team, with SASTA and local government through Anne, um, Anna and others. Um, AA through Jane, I don't know if Jane's still here, but certainly through the Automobile Association, which represents, it's a membership organisation for drivers, so it's incredibly important that we're working with them too. Other membership organisations that we've been talking with and had some healthy debate with through the, throughout the process, Pharmaceutical Society of New Zealand, who are obviously the membership of organisation for pharmacists, the Royal New Zealand College of GPs, membership org of organisation for GPs, and GPNZ as a network organisation as well. Um, in our, um, Helen Paulson spoke earlier, and we have a close um, interactive relationship with Dr Paulson, who has in fact been the person who's worked closely with us in terms of the integrity of our analysis of the medications that have been prescribed in terms of likelihood or otherwise to impair. Um, Helen has also been instrumental in terms of reporting on and the analysis of the re retesting of blood alcohols that Anne's going to share with you today. Within this project, we're working within the definition of, in terms of our definition of substance impaired driving, we're saying that this is drivers at risk of driving impaired due to the effects of medications or drugs that affect with or without alcohol. So that's the context of our definition. We're also working within the context that within New Zealand it's illegal to drive impaired by any substance at all, and that includes prescription medications. We also acknowledge, too, that we're working within the context in terms of the retesting and the information we're going to give you of the presence of, and we realise the difficulty around presence or absence of and causality, too. 
Anne's going to talk to the, some of the evidence that we can share with you, and then I'll come back at the end in terms of, so how are we using it, and what are we developing from it? So when we started out this project working in partnership with all those different agencies, we identified um, that there is a lack of, there's a real barrier to tackling substance impaired driving. The perception out there is that it's not widespread, it's really not a problem, and we probably shouldn't need to deal with it at all. We are finding that there's very little action being taken from health professionals, from friends and family of people who are driving, from drivers themselves who are at risk of substance impaired driving. We also found that there was limited action by strategic groups and audiences, and it all seems to be related to the fact that there's also limited monitoring. So there's limited priority or funding to the monitoring. So for example, in New Zealand, um, the road toll for deaths suggests that there's 30% of all deaths are caused by alcohol and drugs, and that 4% in the latest stats of, um, of the total is drugs, and that 26 is alcohol. That suggests that it's not a particularly significant issue. What we're finding, though, that, that is that this well-publicised piece of data is actually causing us to believe our own data is there's no thing to worry about, we don't need to monitor it, um, and we really had a huge lack of information. So people are talking about having lack of information internationally, but we had even more of a lack of information in New Zealand. So um, we have tried to identify what do we know and what can we find out um, without having a huge study budget. So we worked with Ministry of Health and Pharmac and gathered um, information on prescriptions. So we have a whole year of data working with ESR to identify which ones could impair driving. And we have age, gender, ethnicity uh, bands of data and what is being prescribed. We also have done surveys of 2,000 New Zealand drivers. Uh, we've done surveys of um, around 100 GPs, it was a voluntary survey. Um, also a couple of hundred of pharmacists, some public health nurses, and several hundred um, operational police. And from that, we've got a good understanding of people's knowledge, attitudes, and behaviours around driving and or cautioning or supporting drivers to do safe decisions. Then the other piece of information, um, because we had such a limited information about, well, does this even happen in New Zealand? So apart from survey data having self-report, we thought we could have a good look at the um, blood alcohol, uh, blood samples that are taken, as Margaret mentioned. Um, and from that, we have now been able to set the scene. We actually have got quite a lot of um, layers of data. None of it's very, very solid, but what we have is we're showing that New Zealand drivers are at risk. So we know that one in four medications given out each year to people of driving age is for a medication that could impair driving, and that's not including the repeats, so it's really relatively common. So these, uh, in most cases, the, f the top uh, five by um, frequency, uh, painkillers, antidepressants, various uh, heart uh, blood pressure medications, so there's beta blockers and calcium channel inhibitors, um, antihistamines and sleeping tablets, that's the five common ones, make up about two thirds of the meds. And then the rest are things like antipsychotics, um, benzodiazepines for anxiety or sleeping or whatever, um, and also zopiclone, um, and also drugs for things like ADHD, so stimulants. So it's relatively common that you could be in a situation driving um, with a medication in your, that you've been prescribed. We also know that almost uh, around 80% of New Zealand drivers indicate that they drink alcohol. And we also know that from the survey we have done of a couple of thousand drivers is that around two out of three drivers took something last year in terms of medications. That might be not prescription, it could be over-the-counter medications that could have impaired their driving last year. Um, and in the same study, we asked people whether they could have been affected by taking medications or drugs with or without alcohol in the last year, and one in six said, yes, I think I have been. Um, we didn't ask them what it was, we don't know whether they took illicit drugs or because we were doing a large online survey, we didn't want to go too far down the illegal kind of story. We wanted just to get some data. And then the other piece of data we've done is we've got uh, 1,100 blood alcohol concentration samples retested. Um, it's over three policing regions. The region where we're doing this most work is um, in the central, so a lower sort of North Island, where we're going to be working mostly with the GPs. Um, we've also got two other regions where we're doing the work. So we're getting all of the samples um, tested from those regions and we've got a 
just over a year of data. So a year after they have been taken and the process, the people have been gone through the courts, we have then retested them. We found some really interesting information. The fact is that um, around 40% uh, of the people who have been convicted drink drivers have historic cannabis or drugs or medication in their blood. If we take out the historical recent cannabis, um, then it's around the 15% of those with the lowest back samples, so 80 to 100%, 100 um, milligrams. Um, if you look at the people with really high blood alcohol concentrations, it's actually less drugs that impair. So this one in seven here, this is for those that are actually very impairing. And they're things like meth, amphetamine, benzodiazepines, those tricyclic antidepressants that are considered more impairing that Helen's helped us identify, and also opiates like tramadol and codeine. Um, there are, if you also include those that don't tend to impair except when you first take them or when you have a lot of alcohol, then the numbers actually stack up as even more people. So it's around um, one in five of people have got some medication or drugs in their system that could impair if they took it with alcohol. Bearing in mind that all these people were over the legal limit, so they all had alcohol. This suggests that, two things, it suggests that there is a con situation going on in New Zealand we've got some pretty good data. It also suggests that there is a lot of people who could be breath tested in New Zealand uh, under the illegal alcohol limit who could be quite impaired by the combination of medications and drugs that they're taking, whether or not they've prescribed them. They could be using others. So from the survey data, we've also identified that the knowledge is very limited and there's almost no education, or really a little bit less than we hoped. We found that around 30% of health professionals don't warn and caution drivers as a habit. They don't say, watch out for this medication. We found that um, most of them don't discuss options or alternatives to driving. Um, and that's around 70% don't do that. So they might stick a sticker on or mention very briefly that they need to watch out. We found that half of drivers who had used medications in the last year don't ever recall having been told to be careful about driving with them. So these are medications that could impair driving. And we also found that most drivers can't tell you what the signs and symptoms are of impaired driving. Um, for example, uh, about a third of them can give you one or no symptoms, and they basically talk about dr drunken drunkenness as the symptoms. We also know that the police detection enforcement is very limited. We all know the story about that. We've been talking about it today, so I won't go into that in great detail, but there's a lot of barriers exist to that process. The thing is, the drivers know that. Um, so I don't want to go labouring on the complexity of it. I think you guys realise that it is very complex, but even after several years, we're getting an awful lot of pushback about this is too hard, it's not something we need to worry about. But we also know that it's not easy to respond to because the effects of um, impairing medications and the combinations of polydrug use, such as alcohol and medications, um, means that there's a lot of variable reactions in terms of people's level of impairment. And Margaret's going to talk about the solution we've put in place. Thanks, Anne. In terms of the evidence that Anne has referred to, um, the surveys and the outcome that she's referred to, we've factored that in. We've also had, um, pr we've presented and had quite a lot of rigorous discussion in the health sector um, with like agencies and also an initial um, set of focus grouping with GPs and pharmacists together in the same place in both Whanganui and also in Wellington. And at that time, we actually took them some of the early evidence that we had. And we thought some of the things we were going to say, if we put it in front of them, they wouldn't want to know. We said, what, what would you want to be able to, to take talk to a patient about? And effectively, they wanted the hard edge stuff. They wanted the, the reality, the evidence, the people to whom we spoke. Um, also, our thinking has been informed and enhanced by discussion around a strategic level across agencies. And also within the agency, I acknowledge the complementarity of what the advertising team in terms of my colleagues Rachel and, and um, Vic are doing in terms of raising awareness. Had to catch the ball then, Vic. <laughs> So what we know from what Anne has said, we know that drivers actually do care. We know that when drivers know about this from the surveying we've done, that they 
are prepared to consider based on a ra raised awareness and knowledge to actually make some responsible decision. We also know, and we're highly aware as everybody else is, and they've spoken to it earlier, the fact that there are some risks around this. If the messages are too simple in a complex area, that's a risk. We don't want to risk self-medicating. We don't want people to stop driving and enhance some s potential of social isolation. We don't want people to stop taking their meds at all so they can go and have the GNT at the bowling club. That's not what it's about. Um, what we're coming away with, and this is what the health professionals said to us when we first focus grouped with them, is we need the motivation needs to come from persuasive data, um, data that will motivate change at both community and strategic um, level, and that will come from both international data and that which we've collected. So what we're saying is um, we're looking at a community-based solution. We're looking at education with enhanced um, detection and enforcement. And we have to acknowledge too at this point that police throughout the process have been totally on board with the continuum of inform, educate, enforce in that order. So certainly police are very much on the vanguard of actually prevent prevention in this. So what we have provided is um, we have worked with um, pharmacists and GPs. Um, we are not out to um, demonise medications. We're not out to demonise health professionals. We're not out to demonise drivers at all. What we have um, produced, and it's not in final form, yet, um, is a, what we're calling a safe to drive conversation. And we're taking it out in the next few weeks to go back to focus group with GPs and pharmacists, getting them together, police will be in the room as well. And our idea there is we talk about some of the evidence, we talk about some of within this, and so the idea is that GP or pharmacist, or a mixture of both, have that safe to drive conversation the first time they actually prescribe a medication for a patient that could impair their capability to drive with or without alcohol. Within this too, it, it has room for the GP to write the medications and it has a checklist of, I shouldn't drive at all, I shouldn't drive for a while, I shouldn't drink, I should, it, it has a, a checklist as it, it's a tool for the GPs. The other piece of information we've provided too, which we're taking out, the list that um, Dr. Polson helped us to uh, put together, apart from the fact sheet from GPs that actually highlights the medications that make up for 96% of scripts written in this country, um, in, a, in that particularly given year that could impair with or without alcohol. We've produced a total list um, to give to GPs underneath those classifications. Now, we're not claiming this to be an exhaustive list, but we are saying it's going to be a tool that we'll take to them that they can look at and discuss with us. Based on the feedback from this, we'll modify as needed. We're going to be asking those GPs also for a commitment and those pharmacists to actually pilot this with a given number of patients in the next couple of months. And to, um, we also want to be able to approach patients who agree to this. We're not going to be asking what their condition is, frankly, but what we do want to do is focus group the patients who've had the safe to drive conversation, and either by telephone or face to face, and say, how was this for you? Has anything changed? Has anything happened in terms of family as passengers, as we've said earlier in the day, that will change behavior because of this? And then report upon that. So effectively, the model that we've been working through is one of evidence, starting off with evidence, um, international data, and certainly the evidence we've gathered here. And as we said, as Anne said, there's a total paucity of data here. Um, hopefully, we're building that. We're looking at to local pilot, and then based on the local pilot, we will adapt and fit. Um, we want to motivate through um, education resources that are used through trusted influences, and we see that trusted influences are definitively people in the health profession. Um, we'll provide them with tools um, to educate, and it's going to be tailored. It's tailored through feedback and through the processes we've gone through to develop it. Sorry, I've got the microphone here, people. Um, so the emergent actions are police educate. Police have a lot of to do with this too, in terms of both informing and educating drivers. Um, we're looking also as a next group of influences, particularly um, the employer factor of the large rigs, you know, the large employers, um, looking at CBO, you're looking with police in that too, because um, we believe there are some issues. Um, one of the reasons we chose the central district region was the proximity to gas, forestry, oil, in terms of the operators there. Um, with the 
emergent change in health and safety legislation in this country and workplace, a uh, workplace, um, we're looking to the implications within organisations themselves, our own organisation and the organisations in which these people work and drive, as information we can feed into. Um, we've had early discussions too with people from civil aviation and also from maritime as well who are interested in this outcome. Moving forward, I mean, as um, Rachel said earlier, this is grounded in safer journeys and the safe system approach and the safer journeys documentation to 2020. So we're working in terms of systems approach with safer journeys um, partners using various roles. It's evidence-based. Um, we want to motivate to action. We've been using infographics, another way of presenting information to get evidence-grounded information, but something that someone is going to be able to look at and uh, find accessible and it is tailored. Um, to date, this, um, pr this project has informed decisions on detection and enforcement to date and certainly police are at the, at the vanguard once again in terms of producing resources for their frontline policing and certainly for their senior road policing people. And the other, the other um, part of this um, is not just educating um, the drivers themselves. On the way through the project, and it's still happening, the health professionals themselves, uh, they're upping their own awareness and knowledge. So in working together, we're actually educating those who are educating effectively. Um, so uh, in terms of going forward, trusted influences, having conversations. Drivers making responsible decisions. We're not out to infantilise driving population, as I said before, or to demonise them in any way at all. We want people based on the trusted advice they're given and their raised awareness to make responsible decisions themselves. And um, of course the most important thing is collaboration across the system.